next speaker, Dimitri Veras, will talk about the, uh, the dust uh, inside systems to build planners. If you still have your hands uh, raised, uh, you can please take them down again. Hi, everybody. Albert, can you see my screen okay? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, I've just put it into slideshow mode. Uh, well, everybody, thanks very much for, for letting me uh, talk at my first APN conference. Uh, my name is Dimitri Veras from the University of Warwick, and I'm happy to talk to you today about grain size distributions in planetary systems around asymptotic giant branch stars. So on this slide, I list five papers, which are the basis of my presentation and contain all of the plots that I'm going to show you. So the first two papers, written with Vagolo Sotos, Arika Higuchi, and Shiguru Ida, involve the influence of a planet, whereas the last three papers listed, written with Seth Jacobson, Siegfried Egel, Dan Shears, and Boris Gansica, they do not involve the influence of a planet, but rather only smaller bodies such as boulders and dust. So the focus of my talk is indeed on planetary systems around giant branch stars, uh, which do affect the distribution of dust. And I would argue that this, around giant branch stars, this is the most violent period of a planetary system's life. It also represents the intermediate phases and can be thought of as the transition between the relatively quiescent main sequence and white dwarf phases. Uh, and crucially, in the giant branch stellar phases, we expect there to be planetary objects of all sizes. These include not just dust, sand, and pebbles, but also boulders and minor planets, as well as larger planets. In fact, we observe over 100 giant planets orbiting giant branch stars. But what about the individual minor planets such as asteroids? We can't observe those in main sequence systems and we can not observe them in giant branch systems either. But we predict that minor planets will survive a star's entire main sequence lifetime because we actually see these asteroids individually in white dwarf planetary systems. And if they exist in white dwarf planetary systems, then they were present during the giant branch phases. So quickly, here are just two high profile examples. And these examples help illustrate that these exo minor planets, they are a reality. And thinking about their evolution and their potential breakup into dust during these giant branch phases is important. So because they can actually play a significant role in understanding this, this grain size distribution around asymptotic giant branch stars. So let's return to the AGB and consider the important effects that influence this grain size distribution. So the first effect is the YORP effect. The YORP effect refers to the change in the rotation of a minor planet due to a radiative torque. So very gradually, a minor planet's spin can increase and eventually cross a critical threshold and break itself apart. And when the minor planet breaks itself apart, it will create grains and dust. Now, the size of the minor planet for which the YORP effect acts are shown in the red circle. These sizes correspond to bodies with radii in between about 1 meter and 10 to the 6 meters, effectively boulders and asteroids. And in fact, the long-term consequences of the YORP effect are seen in the solar system. However, the solar system contains just the one solar luminosity star. In AGB systems, the luminosity of the stars can reach up to 10 to the 4 solar luminosities. And so these AGB luminosities would effectively supercharge the YORP effect. And in fact, the AGB stars would easily spin up boulders and asteroids to break up speed without the help of any planets. So here's a plot of spin versus time since the star turns off the main sequence for five different initial stellar masses. The horizontal black line is the breakup spin barrier. And you can see that well before these stars become white dwarfs, the asteroids are broken up into dust and grains. It takes only a few million years or tens of million years, whereas in the solar system, the process could take billions of years. And the result of this breakup is that fragments, grains, and dust are strewn throughout the system. So here is a plot of stellar mass versus maximum destruction distance for asteroids and boulders of different sizes. And as you can see, these fragments can be generated out to distances of hundreds or thousands of AU. And further, the YORP effect creates successive generations of pulverizations. After breaking up an asteroid into a certain number of fragments, those fragments could then be subjected to the same spin-up and fission. And this repetitive process doesn't end until the AGB star becomes a white dwarf and its luminosity decreases sharply. 
um, or until all of the fragments have been ground down into monoliths. So for example, on this plot, you see four successive generations of asteroid fissions as the AGB star's luminosity increases. And the failure spin rate changes as a function of boulder size. But although this failure rate increases each time, the increasing luminosity of the star is great enough to break apart the fragments into dust. And then the next question one may ask is, well, what happens to these fragments? Well, the answer depends on the size of the fragments. If they are boulder or asteroid size, then the fragments would be subjected to another radiative effect known as the Yarkovsky effect. Now, the Yarkovsky effect describes how objects are propelled by anisotropically re-emitting absorbed radiation. And the resulting drift in the orbit is usually over an order of magnitude stronger than the more commonly known pointing Robertson drag, or PR drag, which acts on, which acts on dust. I know in the solar system, the Yarkovsky effect is observed. However, again, the solar system contains just the one solar luminosity star. AGB stars with much greater luminosities supercharge the Yarkovsky effect, and so much so that the supercharged Yarkovsky effect can propel intact boulders or asteroids to distances of hundreds of AU. In our simulations, we included the influence of a planet as well as the Yarkovsky effect and found that the speed of the boulders allows them to bypass the planet's orbit with little disruption. Here what you see are asteroid evolution tracks in semi-major axis versus time throughout the asymptotic giant branch phase. A few of the asteroids just get temporarily halted in resonances with the planet before continuing on their way. And the Yarkovsky effect can easily break apart these resonances. So here's an example where the Yarkovsky effect propels boulders and fragments inwards rather than outwards because any direction is possible based on the shape and properties of the asteroids, of the fragments. So the path of the planet here is marked, and the plot illustrates semi-major axis versus time from the start of the asymptotic giant branch phase. And you can see here that the planet does disrupt the orbits of the boulders, but not by much, and really only by uh, different times. So given the Yarkovsky model adopted here, the planet merely delays the paths of the asteroids by tens or hundreds of millions of years. But what about the dust and grains, which are subjected to PR drag? too small to be subjected to the Yarkovsky effect. In this case, if a planet is also present in the system, then we can apply the equations from the photogravitational restricted three-body problem with a variable solar lumin uh, stellar luminosity as a function of time. So in the photogravitational restricted three-body problem, one has the star, the planet, and the dust grain. And the forces involved are gravity, mass loss from the star, and changing luminosity from the star. So I'll now show you some results of these calculations. So plotted here is the Jacobi constant, which you can think of as a measure of energy, versus an x-coordinate in units of semi-major axis for particles in a one-planet system containing a two-solar mass star. And in the restricted three-body problem, the star characteristically is at x equals zero, and the planet occupies x equals one, which is why you see these bilobe black features around x equals one and x equals minus one. And the left panel contains a Jupiter-like planet, whereas the right panel contains an Earth-like planet. And the different colors on the plots correspond to different types of orbits of the dust for different energies. So for example, the dark blue corresponds to particle collisions with the star, and the light blue corresponds to escape from the system, which occurs for an exo-Jupiter, but not for an exo-Earth. And the green regular regions correspond to orbits around the planet, orbits around the star, or circumbinary orbits around both the planet and the star. Now these plots are for grains with a radius of 10 millimeters. When the radius size is increased to 50 millimeters, here is the result. Here the green regular orbit region is significantly expanded, meaning that a wider range of particle energies can accommodate grains that remain in the system. Also, some chaotic orbits, which are in yellow, begin to appear in the left plot. And as you can see, these yellow chaotic orbits are not distributed uniformly in this phase space. And we can also consider the types of orbits as a function of stellar mass as it decreases throughout the RGB and AGB. The stellar mass appears on these plots on the y-axis. Here, the initial given energy is fixed for a 10 millimeter radius grains, and what is varied is the stellar mass. So as you look at these plots, you may envision that some of these grains are freshly generated at different times from, say, the Yorp effect or collisions with the planet or micrometeorite impacts. 
And these simulations make no assumptions about the origin of the grains, just what the character of their orbits would be at different times during the RGB and AGB. And finally, we can consider how the character of the orbits change for fixed energy and location as the function of time, as you see here on these time wheels. And these are for 50 millimeter radius grains. We begin at the start of the RGB and traverse clockwise until we reach the tip of the AGB. And these wheels demonstrate how quickly the orbit types change and also the importance of demonstrating when the grains are generated at particular energies. So in conclusion, my collaborators and I have considered a variety of different effects which help determine the grain size distribution and location around AGB stars. The initial conditions of the planetary system are crucial. Not only its existing dust distribution, but also the concentrations of its asteroids and their properties and whether or not a planet survives to the AGB phase. The star's mass and luminosity evolution throughout the giant branch phases then determines the subsequent evolution and also how asteroids actually break up, how the dust drifts, and how the planet and the dust are pushed outward by stellar mass loss. And on top of these effects, the planet's gravity on the dust leads to a quite complex picture overall of what types of grains orbits are allowed and when. So thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, <laughs> I've heard Every time I hear a talk on something new, it's amazing how much I didn't know. <laughs> so this is all new to me. Um, if there's a question already from Rachbendra, who's got a hand up. Yeah, so, yeah, the, I found this talk really stimulating, of course, because as Albert said, I didn't know much about this. But uh, I, um, I've been working on um, protoplanetary uh, or, uh, objects or, or, and looking at the kind of dust continuum from them, amongst other things. And I find that the, um, this, uh, the slope of the continuum emission as a function of wavelength is rather shallow, which indicates the millimeter and sometimes perhaps even centimeter sized grains. And uh, we've always been wondering, at least I have been, where do these very large grains come from? They're always uh, very close to the, to the star itself. So they're not in the extended circumstellar envelope. They may be in the tori around these, uh, which exist in these um, uh, you know, uh, pre-planetary um, uh, nebulae. So I'm wondering if uh, your, um, the work that you've done could explain the presence of these millimeter sized grains, or very large grains in these objects. So by the time those, those objects that you're observing reach the giant branch phase, they've already been uh, processed quite a bit. But what I'll say from an observational point of view is that we actually do know of four um, giant branch systems which contain um, large dust disks. And three of those are known to have a planet. The other one is suspected to have a planet. So we do see um, these dusty disks around giant branch stars. But, but, but during the entire main sequence, I would expect the, the grain properties and the locations to, to change uh, quite a bit just due to dynamical interactions uh, and the generation of fresh dust, perhaps due to gravitational instabilities later on. Um, I'm talking about post main sequence objects. So there's objects ah, which are okay. beyond the AGB. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, so you're okay. finding these large grains there in the, around, this, around the stars, very close to the stars, within a few thousand AU or something. Yes, well, I, I, I think the, the breakup mechanism that I described, um, initially in simulations, it shows that it breaks it up into large fragments. And then only in subsequent breakups does it actually, um, can it break it down further. So, so there is a way of generating large grains that are not completely pulverized into dust uh, because some of these breakup events occur towards the, the tip of the AGB or, or right before really the luminosity um, of the star shrinks down to, to, to what, it be, what it would be for a white dwarf. So, so I think it's based on the timing of the breakup during the AGB that can perhaps explain these larger grains. Thank you. Okay, Oshana. Uh, hi, Dimitri. Thanks. Hi, Ursula. Thank hi. you. Um, so I have a question. One of my interests is to try to determine the configuration of multiple planet system, let's say two planets for simplicity's sake, um, at the time when they start interacting uh, seriously with the envelope of your expanding, say, RGB star. 
And the naive approach is, of course, to do your three body integration, the central star and the two planets, and make sure that that configuration is approximately stable from a just a gravitational point of view for a while, at least as long as the, uh, at the main sequence lifetime. Mm -hmm. But of course, you got these other two effects now. And of course, they're not that important at the beginning. Well, our sun is, you know, for about uh, whatever its main sequence lifetime, but then they rapidly in that million year or two million years or so that I care about coming up to the interaction point that would rain havoc to the configuration, potentially eliminating the planets that I'm looking to engulf. <laughs> so yes. is, there, yeah. is there a quick way, like, okay, of course, there's never a quick way, but um, do you have through your papers a, a way to um, establish what configuration might be arrived at with the, say the RGB star grows to say 50 solar radii. And I want to know whether I can enter Rosh Lobo overflow with the first planet with a second planet at some distance farther away. How do I determine those distances? Uh, okay, so I, I think what you're referring to is, is sort of the, um, the, the critical distance at which a common envelope can somehow at least some entrap a planet. Is that right? No, I, let's say the one planet can be entrapped easily as the planet, okay. as the star goes up the RGB. I mm -hmm. want to know where other planets can be, right? I don't, I, I need another planet to be near enough, but not too, not too near, obviously, otherwise it wouldn't be in a stable orbit. So how do I establish that beyond doing a three body integration? Um, so if you're looking for something that's, that's quick and analytical, um, there are a few papers that have considered uh, successive common envelope um, engulfments uh, to to help actually explain one of the planets that have been found a white around a white dwarf and there are some analytical equations in there I can send you links to those afterwards um, that might be what you're looking for um, but thank um, you because yeah. that, that that's critical if you yeah. want a double common envelope or triple yeah. or more right yeah. Yeah, I have a few papers in mind. I'll, I'll send you links to those. Thank you. Okay, thanks. The uh, last question, Alexei Bobrik. Uh, hey, Dmitry, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I wonder about the pres potential presence of two other physical effects. I wonder if you consider them and if they can matter at all. Uh, one of them being the evaporation of planets by the star because the velocity of star can grow by many, a factor of many uh, orders of magnitude, and uh, so you could maybe evaporate some smaller planets. And the second thing is perhaps, you know, if you imagine the AGB star becoming windy or a giant becoming windy, uh, then can the, some of that wind be accumulated on the planets or asteroids even and lead to their growth? Yeah, the, these are excellent questions. The evaporation question uh, has now been studied in a little more detail because one of the planets that have been found around a white dwarf, we actually um, uh, found it based on its evaporating atmosphere. So the, the level of evaporation uh, has been looked at in more detail around giant branch stars. And the, um, the result is that for Jupiter mass planets, the, um, the radiation is not of a sufficient energy to remove much of the atmosphere. It's really only on the order of a percent or so when you have giant planets. Um, it's it just, uh, but, and then for the actual, um, your other question was, uh, sorry, what was your other one? About the potential wind accumulation. Right. Uh, yeah, that, that has not been explored. And actually, um, there's a, a very important chemical aspect to that in terms of what can accumulate on the asteroids because eventually we actually see the, um, the chemical composition of those asteroids within the white dwarfs. And so it's been an outstanding question is how much of the AGB winds chemically contaminate the asteroids um, that we actually end up seeing. Um, but there hasn't been a dedicated study on that yet. So that's certainly something to be explored more. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you. I'll stop the, sharing. Yeah. Yeah. This stops the, uh, the, the first hour of the, uh, the meeting. We'll now have a 10 minute break because uh, zooming can be quite tiring and intensive staring at the screen for so long. Um, we'll start again in 10 minutes with uh, Rafendra's talk. So feel free to go and uh, have a break. Look somewhere else than the screen.